is going on, baseball fans? Welcome to This Week in Baseball, episode 22 of season two. We are coming towards the end here. I'm your host, Jordan Zowski. I am back. I appreciate Diego Franco Carreno for basically carrying me for about four to six weeks over the past month, month and a half. Uh, he's done an excellent job filling in, and I'm sure he will be on many, many more episodes. But I'm back, and I am looking forward to talking with four additional panelists this evening. Jay Roy, Jonathan Roy, Christian Lloyd, Quinn Mortimer, and Sam Chapman. How are we doing, folks? Pretty sad. Doing great. On top of the world. Doing pretty great. At least everyone else is doing great. That's what really matters. As usual, we've got a loaded show. Um, what we'll talk, as usual, about the standings. Less is changing now because we are right at playoff time, which is exciting. We'll talk a little bit about everyone's individual recaps for each day uh, for this week. And then we'll head into the main show, seventh inning stretch. So... Without further ado, let me jump right in. If the season ended today, let's talk about the standings. In the American League Central, the White Sox have clinched the division. I'm very happy about that. The Tampa Bay Rays have also clinched the AL East. See, I like this part of this mute thing with this with these audio troubles. Christian can't say anything right now about the White Sox. Anywho, the AL East, the Rays have won the division. In the AL West... The Astros lead the division by five games over Seattle. The magic number out there is two. Your two wildcard teams as of right now, Boston and New York. Toronto, a game and a half back of them. Seattle, two and a half games back. It's still anyone's wildcard out there. In the National League, the Braves' magic number to win the NL East is five. The Brewers have won the NL Central. And we've got a nice little uh, battle, as has been all year in the NL West. The Giants still leading the division by two games. Their magic number is five over the Dodgers. Your two wildcard teams out there, no surprise, the 100-win Dodgers. And the 87-win, still respectable, St. Louis Cardinals. So we've got some happy people on this podcast. We have some not-so-happy people on this podcast. Um J. Roy with a magic number of one out on the wild card for the Phillies. That's about done for you, unfortunately. Um, we have a lot to talk about. With divisions in reach, though. though. Divisions in reach. The though. divisions, the, the divisions, close enough ish for you. Um, I don't want to steal too much from all of you and your recaps, so I'm just going to jump right into that. Around the league in 60 seconds, you know the usual. Whatever you, whatever each of our panelists feel like they wanted to highlight this week and make sure they uh, get, got their word in. I'll start really quickly because Diego, in his absence, has asked me to say this very quote, and it will be my only around the league in 60 seconds this year. Captain Brandon Belt of the San Francisco Giants could be the first Giant 230 home runs since Barry Bonds, and he might be one of the least talked about Giants this year. We can debate that. I, I I know Diego has had his qualms with how many people either don't recognize or have ignored the Giants. So that one's for him and for filling in so greatly. I'm going to turn it over to you guys, though. We'll start with the man whose team is on a 16-game winning streak. We're going to go with Quinn to start. Yeah, so um, in the last week, the Cardinals have won, and then they've also won another game and then another <laughs> game and about uh, 13 more. So, well, that was more than a week ago. But, yeah, they haven't lost since September 10th. And at that point, they were about three games, I want to say three games out of the second wild card spot and had like a, a, like a 5% chance of making the playoffs according to Fangraphs. And now they're at about 99.9%. Uh, yeah, their magic number is currently one, and the Brewers did just clinch the division, but the Cardinals held them off for quite a bit considering the Brewers' magic number was three like over a week ago. Um, yeah, so it has been fun, I would say. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. J-Roy? <laughs> 
Uh, you know, the Phillies lost tonight to the Pirates, which is, uh, you know, kind of couldn't happen, but they had won six straight before that. You know, last course of the last week, every game has been a must win, and they've been winning them. Granted, like three of those games came against the Pirates, but still, uh, you know, we finally got a good start from Nola. Wheeler looked good on the mound, gotten some really good contribution from, uh, you know, a few different offensive pieces. Uh, you know, it's it's going to be a long haul over the course of the next week. It'll be an uphill battle trying to win this division against the Braves. It pretty much all comes down to this series uh, against the Braves that they have this next week. Uh, honestly, they could sweep them, and if they if they drop two of three to Miami, they're, they're still not going to win the division. So, I mean, it's an uphill battle, but it's, it's a shot. They've got a shot at it. So, uh, you know, they're going to have to come out, play their best baseball every single day. It'll be fun to watch, you know. Uh, you know, even I don't know. I'm not too enthusiastic. Even if they they get into the playoffs, I don't know what's going to happen. But I haven't seen Phillies playoff baseball in a long time, so I, anything is better than nothing. I, I really hope they get in. I think it's hard as you're coming down the stretch here to both fight mm-hmm. against a, a Braves team who has been strangely hot after losing their outfield and, and who is a better for, team. You know, yeah, for a certain point, team. and you're like. The NL East has been a weird one this year. You got the Mets who have fallen out of contention, and they were leading the division for quite some time. The the NL East remains wild, basically. Christian, your recap. You're muted. It's going to be of the Angels, who have just been completely, utterly embarrassing to watch. As a fan, I've just been so disappointed watching them. Uh, today, Shohei Otani has made some comments that um, hopefully sparks a fire on Artie Moreno, because the complacency has just been disrespectful to the fans. Otani said, I really like the team, I love the fans, and the atmosphere the team provides, but he wants to win above all else, and where the team is at right now is not a winning team. Uh, it's reiterating the comments Madden made earlier in the week. We want to win. We want players on this team. We need to have a big offseason. And uh, as far as extension talk goes with Otani, it's it's a real make or break for us right now. The team's really frustrated. The core players are really frustrated. And David Fletcher has been horrible. He's the second worst WRC plus among qualified hitters. And it's just been embarrassing to watch him. When it rains, it pours is kind of the mantra of being a Los Angeles Angels fan, unfortunately. I don't know. I, I, From my personal standpoint, I hope you don't have to look too much into the Otani comments long term, um, especially after quite the year he's had and quite the career he's probably going to put up here in the States. So, Sam, bring us home. Uh, so, I, I like that Jay Roy was talking about the NL East because I've – I'm very invested in that race for some reason, because I feel like it hasn't been talked about very much and it's like reasonably close. And I also like that the Phillies are making their charge by winning, uh, by beating like the pirates and the Orioles, like eight, seven and stuff like that. It's been, it's, it's been a good time to watch. Uh, and then also, uh, so Juan Soto for September is up to a six eleven OBP, I believe, uh, and four seventy three on the year, uh, which is, are both, horrifying and uh and I, it's a, as good a time as ever to remind everybody that barry bonds sustained a 609 over an entire year which is just always a fun time to think about so yeah when you start getting into barry bonds territory you start hearing about some uh some wild numbers that's right I mean, personally i would throw the guy more strikes like i mean i like <laughs> yeah would you I, w- I would. I mean, personally, like, I just wouldn't walk him. Like, I, I mean, just, I mean, he's he's not Stanton. He didn't have Stanton power. Just, th- I mean, just throw him strikes. Like, it'd be better than what's happening now, like, the way pitchers are throwing him now. Like, it's like, with, it's like it was the same thing with Bonds. Like, yes, like, he had, like, a 609 OBP one year. But, like, that's because pitchers were scared of him. If, he, if they had thrown to him, I think, like, the outcomes actually would have been better for them. Like, you know, like. I don't know. That's just that's just me not not wanting to give uh, Soto his flowers. So, but you know. Speaking of being in Bonds territory over the week, Shohei Otani was walked 14 times in a four-game span. No one has ever done that. The only players uh, he had 13 walks in three games. The only players to have ever done that is Barry Bonds and Bryce Harper during his 2015 season. 
So it's the frustrations as an Angel fan of the what the lineup is now. It's been capped off by teams finally just not pitching to Otani. Yeah, I think that's the only viable strategy at, at a certain point, for, especially for someone like Otani. Um, he's been absurd, to put it as succinctly as possible. That it, it's been absolutely wild. All right. I did my around the league in 60 seconds, so I have uh, fulfilled my duty in terms of the host in place of Diego this evening. So let's jump into seventh inning stretch. I think you guys mostly covered it. I think the biggest story is going to be, as I pull up the handy-dandy scoreboard, the biggest storyline of the week is what Quinn had started to mention. The St. Louis Cardinals and their 16-game winning streak are, are worthy of leading off this section, obviously, as this streak all but guaranteed them a spot in the NL wildcard game. I guess we'll start with uh, Quinn on this one. Any chance this team beats L.A. or San Francisco in the wildcard game, and how far could they reasonably go? All right, so the Dodgers are, of course, very good. Um they, you could argue that they have been the best team in baseball each of the past or four of the past five years. Um, yeah, they won their reigning World Series champions. Um, they should be beating everybody. They probably should be beating the Giants in the division right now, but it's still up in the air how that's going to go. How that's going to go. Um, that being said, it's a one-game playoff. Like, you take a one-game playoff, the Diamondbacks could beat the the, the Rays in a one-game playoff, but like 30, 40 times out of 100, probably. Um, it's, yeah, there, there's just no telling how one game's going to go. So, I mean, they probably shouldn't beat the Dodgers in the in a one game playoff. They certainly shouldn't be knocking them out like on October 6th or whatever it is, but it is definitely possible. Um, and as far, as far as how far as how far they can go. Um, yeah. So the first two teams they would be facing are the Dodgers and giants. Both of them are of course, very good. They're both going to end up with, what like 105 plus wins on the season uh probably so yeah if the, the, those are definitely going to be the two biggest challenges in the NL and then after that it'll be either the Phillies, Braves or Brewers and those are all good teams of course but none of them are as good as the as the Giants or Dodgers are this year so Again, like they aren't better than the Dodgers or Giants, but in a one game or five game series, like basically anything can happen. So yeah, that's yeah, I think I think if I th I would say if they played the game like a hundred times, the Cardinals would win maybe 40, 45 of them. So you just never know how it's gonna go. I respect a very tempered take from a Cardinals fan on a 16 game winning streak. I respect that. Uh, Jay Ray, let's go over to you, your thoughts on the Cardinals. Absolutely. They could win the wild card game. Like not even, not even a question. Like, I, I mean, it's the wild card game. Like the Cardinals do this nonsense every year where they, they, they win games that they have zero reason to win. Like zero, like objectively, they have no reason to be in the conversation. And then they, they win the game. Like, it happened in 2011. It happened. It's happened so many times over the course of the last decade. I, they, they, the, the teams that win the World Series are almost always the teams that perform the best in September going into October, the teams that are the hottest. Like, like I mean, the Cardinals have, have as good a chance as literally anyone to go out there, beat the Dodgers or the Giants in the wild card game, and make a big splash in the, in the postseason. Like, I, yes, Wainwright could go out there in, the, in a one-game playoff, dial back the clock a little bit, give you seven innings, seven solid innings, and, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the maybe the Cardinals' uh, rough shirts are up a little bit. You know, like any anything can happen. Like there's 
there's no there's no guarantees. You know, I think they'd have even a better shot if they played the Giants. But I mean, absolutely, the Cardinals can absolutely they can pull this off. Christian, your thoughts on the Cardinals? Well, the Cardinals have what we know is devil magic. Every single season, <laughs> every time they're in the playoffs, some random monstrosity nonsense happens. This team is not as good as the Dodgers. It's not close to being as good as the Dodgers. Their lineup is nowhere near as good. Their pitching's nowhere near as good, like starting and relief pitching. But they have devil magic. <laughs> if the St. Louis Cardinals had won the division, I uh, they they get bounced immediately. But because this is a damn wild card team, Cardinals, they can take it all the way, and I would not be surprised in the slightest. <laughs> they did this. Um, was it two thousand five or two thousand six? When they had two thousand six, the they were barely above five hundred, and they won the damn World Series. Like no business. In twenty eleven, they did this. <laughs> in uh. 2019 against the Braves, Yadier Molina gets a blue broken bat single, and the entire world shatters. The Cardinals have devil magic. They can easily win this, and they have no business winning it. Chalk it up to devil magic. I'm good with that. Sam, you going to make it four for four here. Yeah, I'm absolutely on board. Uh, so <laughs> so the, the fifth – are we at, we're at 16 games in a row now, right? Yes. Yeah, so it's it's – it's no longer funny. It's just, uh, you know, just upsetting to look at, but, uh, uh, and, and just with, with the devil magic and, and just the way of the world, uh, like Christian said, this, that team is not nearly as good as the giants or the Dodgers, but there's no way they're losing a wild card game. They're absolutely going to win. You can put the house on it, but, uh, uh, as far as the rest of the playoffs, I don't know. I don't know if I trust that pitching staff. I don't know if I, want to be led by, you know, Wainwright, Lester, and Hap. That's not the not the crew you absolutely want, but uh, I I have no doubts that it's certainly possible. And with a one-game playoff or really any series, uh, it's mostly a coin flip. Uh, that's just how it is in baseball. Uh, and so for that reason, I have no doubt in them, but, but we shall see. Wainwright, Hap, Lester, what year are we in? That, that that's the question that continues to need to be asked. <laughs> Christian, it looks like you're saying something, but you're muted. You could have Eric Bedard and Scott Kazmer in that same rotation. <laughs> they all they all came up together. It's just it's so asinine that that team is what that is. I don't understand. I mean, the it's, problem is we already have one of those teams this year. It's the Giants. Like, we, we don't need two of these types of teams this year. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that Scott Casimiro starting was deeply upsetting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a hard one to look at. It is close yeah. to a guarantee. It is close to a guarantee that Lars Newtbar is taking Max Scherzer deep. Like, that is the full <laughs> <Absolutely. conclusion. laughs> I, I think that the Giants and the Cardinals are collaborating on their cheating lab operations. Or something. Honestly. Like, and, something the like Brewers. and the Brewers. Like, they, none is, of those teams. Yeah. Like, that is the only explanation for any of this, in my opinion. See, Scott Casimir's career ended in 2010 when he was with the Angels. He was done. He like retired, and it's 2021, and he's back for like the 15th time. It's I don't understand how he can keep getting away with this. Wasn't he throwing like 95 or 96 too? I hope not. I really hope it was. Not. I thought that could, that could be false, but I thought I saw that, and that's even worse. Sometimes you gotta wonder where some of this devil magic comes from, but I'm not. I'm not one to ask questions on this one, at least. Speaking of devil, in a way, I don't know. That was a terrible transition. We're going with it. You'll get it. Inning number two, the Tampa Bay Rays and Kevin Kiermeyer this week made news. I'm actually very interested in this answer. Made news on a play at home plate. During the play, the Blue Jays catcher Alejandro Kirk had a sheet containing uh, scouting reports on the Rays drop out of his pocket, or maybe it was within his uh, the band he wears on his arm. Either way, drops out. Kiermeyer picks it up. Takes it to the dugout. Uh, it was eventually given back to the Blue Jays the next day. Kiermaier was also hit in the series. My question is simply this. Your thoughts? Clean? Dirty? Should he have done it? Should he have not have done it? We will start with Sam. All right. So, first of all, 
maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I don't know any major leaguers personally, but I think I would have to imagine almost everybody in the league picks up that card. I, I, that's what I would think at least. And from the Blue Jays' perspective, like yeah, competitively, I'd be upset that that happened too. But you know, being an outsider uh, looking in, like, can you? I can't really blame Kiermaier. As far as him getting hit goes, uh, I would say in pretty much every situation, I'm anti-intentional hit by pitch. Like, I, I don't think there's any good reason to ever do that. Uh, especially, like, I mean, you could see this one coming, but I feel like uh, given the fact that probably anybody on the Blue Jays would have done the same thing, uh, you know, just as, just as unacceptable as, as it ever is in my mind. Christian, your thoughts. Uh, so firstly, from a catching perspective, I love all that gear on them. I think it makes you look so cool. I always wanted to wear a cat, <laughs> like all that extra catching gear. And um, it is hard as hell to knock that paper out of his socket. Okay. I, I feel bad for Alejandro Kirk because that's something like just never happens. Never, never happens. Um, if I'm the Blue Jays, I'm drilling Kevin Kiermaier. Don't care. Don't matter. If I'm the Tampa Bay Rays, uh, I'm picking up that damn note. Uh, if any of them, if I see my teammate not pick up that note, um, what the fuck are you doing? You know, like that's, you have to, that's no matter what. Absolutely. I, I see both sides to it. You should never intentionally hit someone, but like it happens. That's, we're never going to get rid of that. I understand why they drilled him. I understand why Kevin Kiermaier was mad and yeah, it just shitty situation to be in. J Roy, for some reason, I feel like you have an alter or an alternative opinion on this one. Uh, you would be correct. I I don't agree. With, <laughs> I, I I don't agree with Christian or Sam. I I don't really dig the, what Kiermaier did. I think that, I, and I don't really like the assertion that every major leaguer does the same thing. I don't know if that's true. I think every major leaguer makes the slide like he did, sees the note knocked down, the paper knocked down, and glances at it, looks at it, and tries to mentally process as much information as they can to pick it up bring it back to the dugout. I don't think like, I don't, I mean, maybe I'm off on this, but I don't think that's something every single player in the league is going to do virtually. I don't, I don't really agree with that. I, you know, I think that what, like just picking the note, up, like walking back to the dugout with it, not even really trying to hide it. Like, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really like the move by Kiermaier. I think that it, I mean, I, and I, like Sam said, I'm, I'm almost, always anti-intentionally hitting people. I, I had no problem with them drilling Kiermaier here. Like, I, I just – I don't think it was – I don't know. I wouldn't have done it if I were Kiermaier. Maybe that's why I'm not a Major League Baseball player. But, <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't have done it if I were Kiermaier. I think, you know, like I'm saying, like, you could – like, I'm saying, like, you know, you could make that slide, look at the note, and and memorize, like, a lot of information that's on that card, you know, in, in the – because he, he sits there – he looks at, it's not some like like bang bang thing. He looks at that card for like a few seconds. And then he it's like the wheels are turning in his head. He's like, should I pick this up? Should I not? And then he makes the decision to pick it up. He could have memorized that whole card in that in that five seconds that he's looking at it. And it would have done him like pretty much just as much good. And and you know, then you avoid this this whole fiasco where you're getting drilled the next game. Like I, I don't even I don't even think I just don't think it was a smart move. Even like I mean I think that he could have been a little bit more subtle about it. And you know I, I know I'm definitely in the minority about this, but I don't know I didn't care for it. I'm gonna ask um, follow up questions, but I'm gonna let Quinn give his comments first, okay. and then I will ask follow up questions. All right, so I just want to start off by saying. Kiermaier has been in the league a long time. There is absolutely no way that he didn't know that the cameras were going to pick up on him, see exactly what was going on. Um, and also, I'm not entirely familiar with what happened in the immediate aftermath of that, but he had to know that the catcher was going to realize pretty quickly that that was missing because if the, if it, if it's what they said it was, then – he would be looking at it basically every at bat. So he would be um, like, he would need to be looking at it all the time. So he would probably notice like, Hey, this isn't here. Uh, there's not a whole lot of places it could go. Well, 
I don't know, Baez's earrings seem to disappear around that area, so maybe there is. But anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah, he like I think that there's a difference between like. I think that the fact that it was like an actual tangible object makes it a little bit more questionable because like if you're relaying signs from second base, like that's one thing that's part of the game, like, like picking up on catchers. But once you like see a card, you say like, okay, this is actually their physical, a physical item that they have that they use to look at the plans. Um, then that's almost like, like, I mean, I don't want to say it's like the same as like taking something that belongs to them, but I mean, just the fact that it's a physical object, I think makes it um, sort of different. And I don't know. I think that a lot of players probably would do that. And like I said, he had to know that he was going to be seen doing that. And it w it was going to be very, everybody was very quickly going to pick up on what he was doing. But um, so <laughs> I would say that like he had to know that like this is what I'm going to do. Everybody's going to know that I did it. And he kind of, like what he said after he's like, "Oh, I just picked it up not knowing what it is." Like I don't believe that for a second. Like he he had to know that it was something important. Um but yeah, that's I I wouldn't go so far as to say it's dirty, but it's probably not completely ethical. Um, which, but also that goes for a lot of things in baseball, like throwing at hitters, for example, isn't really ethical, but that's also what happened in the aftermath of the situation. And it's just, yeah, like, like you were saying, it's gonna, like players are going to continue to be hit no matter how everybody likes it. So, yeah. All right. Before we continue on to the next question, I have follow-up questions for Mr. J. Roy. Okay, so you, you, so your alternative to this was look at the card, memorize it quickly, and move on. So what's so, in in your opinion, what's the problem then with what Kiermaier did? What's the difference between just picking it up, memorizing them, and giving them back to them? versus memorizing them and then let it, what's the difference okay it's all okay first of all okay so it's 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 almost more of an issue of like practicality it's a hundred times more subtle it he Kiermaier is not getting drilled if he sits there looks at it for a second gets the information you know whisper some of it to his teammates they get a little bit of an edge teams are stealing signs all around the league this happens all the time so like this wouldn't even be something out of the ordinary. This wouldn't have even been a national story. Like you save yourself so much like, like anguish and like just extra nonsense. But I like, I don't, I don't understand like why it was smart to just pick it up and like walk off with it. It didn't seem practical to me. Like you could have gotten all the benefit of that and just looking at this. And listen, it, it's the same. It's pretty much the same thing with all the Astro stuff. Like, Everyone knows that every, all these teams are doing all this like cheating stuff, but it's like the manner in which you do it that bothers people. Like, you know, if you're using like this fancy technology to do it, it, it bothers people, which I get. Like, I, you know, I think like from a principal standpoint, it's, it's kind of hard to draw. Cheating. Exactly. Like, I know from a from a principal standpoint, it's hard to draw a line. Like, okay, I'm okay with this. Like, like I'm okay with the runner on second base looking at the catcher's hands and seeing what they're st they're throwing down and relaying that to the batter. Like, okay, I'm okay with that, but I'm not okay with the the Astros using video technology to steal signs. It like the for principles wise, it's the same thing. It's just like a lot, way more people are, you You don't think it's the same thing. No, As I don't the think Astros, it's the not even close. No, I, okay. um, it's firstly, it is legal to steal signs while sitting on second base. If you can decipher a pitcher, uh, catchers, anything mm -hmm. like down there, that's legal, perfectly legal. And it's a part of the game to hide that as a catcher, you're taught to learn that when they are, with the camera out there which all technology is bad but with the camera out there they're watching his all his signals they have every single one down so as soon as you change your signs they know that and it's a completely different i um uh, but yeah to okay okay follow. okay I, I agree that it's completely different but at the end of the day it's 
it's all you're you're you you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing to get an edge. Like at, at the end, like from a principal standpoint. But that's stealing. But if you what? steal signs, uh, for me personally, let me let me put my yeah. I want to hear what you think, Jordan. My line is at technology. Okay. Anything you do that uses technology is no longer. Here's a great example: high school baseball. We we were not very good, but what we used to do we we had at times designated guys who would sit because you in high school coaches make the call to the catcher usually you'd mm. be watching you'd be sitting down writing down okay he goes left shoulder right shoulder nose um chin and you're like and that equals fastball mm -hmm. so you're writing this down trying to figure out okay what's the pattern here what are the signs what's the indicator stuff like that that i fi feel is perfectly legal it's if i were to go take that put it in an excel sheet and have that spit out information for me that that now becomes wrong. Mm -hmm. So in this example, I legitimately believe 90 to 95 percent of baseball players pick up that card. I, yeah. I, and I think that, and I think that's at any level, and from little league all the way up. I think anybody looks at that and goes, "I see an edge. I'm going to take it." That's just how people are. I, I don't. I think it where where I draw the line is the technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is like that's where the line. So it's like where do you define what's wrong, what cheat? Because like stealing signs from second base is cheating. You're stealing signs. So this is like the the line for me is technology. When, once you've brought in a third party that's no longer playing on the field. I, I I agree with you. Like, and I'm, I'm I was in no way bringing that example into condone with the Astros. I think what they did was, was textbook cheating. It's oh it's, no, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, just, it's yeah. just that like there's a difference. Like I I see a, a somewhat similar difference in Kiermaier. Looking at the card, trying to get, just trying to like get the wheels turning, like remember what's on the card, then blatantly picking up the card, walking it so back to his own dugout. You're saying cheat subtly is basically what I, you're saying. I, I aren't agree you saying you. the same I, thing, Jordan? Like, aren't you I, saying? I, the same I, I agree. That there's a difference here, though. Um, I, yeah, if, there's if a you difference. Just look at it and drop it. Uh, I, but I also I want to add two things. Firstly, uh, that was just about like their pitching plans and their game plans towards um, race hitters. The Rays, they fucking know that. know that. Yeah, they know exactly how you're pitching to them. Um, so they don't really need that. Uh, and like Kiermaier just reading it, that maybe benefits him. Maybe but bringing it to them, it certifies you. I don't like. Ah, uh, it's I don't know, Jira. It's, it, 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 it's it's subtle. It's really subtle. I like like I just think that if you're you know you're like man, it it like I like I was almost shocked. When I saw the fact that Kiermaier picked up this card, didn't even think twice about it, like did, did not have any qualms about the fact that he walked this back to his own dugout, knowing exactly how the Blue Jays were going to feel about it. Exactly, Quinn, like you said, this like Kiermaier is a vet, man. Like he he knew exactly what the Blue Jays were going to do because Kiermaier would have felt the same exact way if someone at the Blue Jays had done it to them. So I I you know it's just. For him to just do like I don't know I I, 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 think, there's, I think there's a difference between him the, the sl sliding in his natural motion, looking at the card that happened to fall out of Alejandro's you know uh, armband and looking at the information on there, being like oh well look what I stumbled upon and then just being like I'm gonna bring this I'm gonna pick this up this 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 information that the Rays clearly, or that the Blue Jays clearly want to keep to themselves mm -hmm. and give it to my entire dugout. And, you know, like there's, there was no subtlety to that. It, it was almost like, it was like, like you should have, I felt like he should have been smarter about it, honestly. Like, and he ended up getting drilled. Like, that's not fun. Like, I get these right. like, usually hitters, but like, you know, no one wants to get drilled by 95 to the dome. Like, who, like, I mean, I don't know. I have a hard time thinking, like, uh, I have a hard time thinking that he saw that and instantly knew it was theirs. Like that could have easily been his because, like as I said, prior, that's a good it point. Too. Hard, it I, is hard I, as hell to he's knock. He's probably out got he's probably like, got one in his back pocket. Oh too. yeah, he he has all the outfielder plans in the top mm -hmm. of his hat, and like they have a bunch of stuff for sure. Um, so like I think at the very beginning, obviously, as soon as he looked at it, he was like, oh. This is theirs. I'm gonna keep. Yeah, it, it would have taken but, him 0. 0.2 seconds to realize it was theirs. But when, but when he, <laughs> I thought like the first two seconds when he was looking down, like he was mentally processing, like, oh, I dropped my card, and then he saw it. And that was when, like, but I don't, I don't have a problem with the subtlety of that because you want to give your team the advantage. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. If you're not trying to cheat, you're not trying to win. 
And that's, that's, <laughs> he ain't cheating, he ain't trying. There you go. I was thinking of the quote. <clears throat> I don't have too much of a I, problem with Kiermaier, but I would still drill him if I'm the Blue Jays. I, yeah, I get you. You deserve to get drilled because you cheated. You definitely I, deserve to get drilled. You, you, you deserve to get drilled. You cheated. It, it is what it is. Um, I, I, I still see the line of, you know, it's not like he pulled it out of Kirk's back pocket or pulled it directly out. Of, it's like it, it fell out like. Take the second. It's like what I, I'm. If I'm the Blue Jays, I'm like, dude, what? How, how did that fall out? Like, what? What did you do that that fall out? And when it fell out, how did you not recognize it? And you walked away from it. Like, it's like I, I was like, I don't know. I, I think it's a smart move by a veteran to just take it. Maybe he could have been more subtle about it, but I, ninety to ninety-five percent of competitive athletes pick up that card. I think that's why it's hard to sit here. And maybe since you don't, J. Roy, it's a different. It would be like if I were to sit there and pick it up and I'd say, oh, he was so wrong for it. No, no, I would have picked it up too. Let's be honest with ourselves. I, I um, wouldn't pick it up. That's fair. You're a you same know, build you're a, Yeah, you're a better man yeah. than me because I would have been like, I ain't even given this thing back. Like that, that, yeah, That's no ours chance. now. I burned that that's thing ours afterwards. Now. Exactly. That's ours now. I, I just – one for me, if it's between the lines – if it's on the field, I do not have an issue with it. I would start thinking, like, okay, yeah, like, I might get drilled. One of my teammates might get drilled, too. Like, I don't want to put this on them. Like, I mean, there's there's yeah. more there's more at, there's more more at into the equation than just, like, oh, well, let me pick. Like, you know, you got to think about the consequences a little bit. And now, in that exact moment, was he, was Kiermaier thinking about that? Probably not. But I, think, I, mean, I do think that is all relevant. That's a big point, too. You got to make a split-second decision. Mm. Yeah, true. And that split second's like – I want this. This is valuable to me and my team. So good discussion. I think that Great. that was the one I was excited for. Cause I'm like that, that had people torn on Twitter. So mm-hmm. I, I was very curious what everyone felt. I think everyone's, everyone's opinion was consistent, which I appreciate it. It would have been different if Jay Ware was like, Oh, he was so wrong, but I would have picked it up. I appreciate your consistency. Yeah, I would like that, that made a solid argument. You I know, and now this got me a little bit of heat because I, you know, I am an Alex Bregman stand. So like, you know, I, you know, a lot of people <laughs> like, but like, I don't like what the Astros did. I don't, sure. I, you know, it, but you know, that's a different conversation. Yeah, that's fair. I, I, I think, I don't know. It's a tough conversation. I just think, in the heat of that moment, it, it's a it's a tough call to make right there. But let's jump to inning three. The Padres were eliminated from postseason contention this week after winning just six games in September so far, while amid rumors of a clubhouse in disarray. Clearly, changes are going to be need to make need to be made this offseason. We'll start with J. Roy. What do the Padres end up doing this offseason? You know, I I think people are probably freaking out about the Padres a little bit too much. I think that what we thought well, a huge strength for them was going to be their pitching, and their pitching has been kind of meh. You know, I think uh, one of the things that really, really hurt them is the fact that uh, Daniel Sumlamet was out for so much of the year, and he very well could have come out and been their best pitcher. You know, I don't think that they were really expecting – like, Mus- obviously, they you know, they really wanted Musgrove. They went out and got him. You know, he – uh, he's great. He's been their best pitcher. I think that, like, ideally you want, like, Darvish or Snell to be the best pitcher on that staff. And another thing that I didn't really realize until today is that Trent Grisham has not been good this year. Like, he, like he's like he been, like, a pretty much like a two-win player. And for as great as he is defensively, like, that's really underperforming for him. I just – part of me just feels like things just haven't clicked for the Padres this season. It's not necessarily because – you know, their lineup is poor. Their pitching is poor. They don't have enough pieces. It's just things just haven't. It's like it's almost like the inverse of what's happened with the Giants. It's like, you know, it feel like, you know, common sense would tell us that the Padres are way more stacked than the Giants are. But it seems like everything has gone the Giants way and nothing has gone the Padres way. And so, you know, I think that I they'll go out and make some moves this offseason. I don't know. I don't know quite what they might want to go out and get an outfielder. You know, they might want to, I don't know what they're going to do with uh, Tatis permanently. I don't think Tatis is, is a good shortstop. I've been pretty vocal about that. Uh, I think he's a, be- I think he can be a better outfielder. So they've got, you know, they've got a lot of, they've got a lot of work, uh, you know, they, they can move some things around. They can get creative with things. One thing that I would be pretty uh, pleased about is, you know, Tatis had a monster season, you know, he, it was his MVP to lose. 
after Acuna went down, he he did lose it. He did lose it. He's not going to win the MVP, but still monster season. He's going to be like a six and a half win player. Uh, and then Machado and Cronenworth have both been really good this year too. And they need Jake Cronenworth to be really good for the next decade or so. And he was good this year. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what moves they'll make. They, they, there's, there's a myriad of different things they can do. Honestly though, like if they run it back next year and they have everyone healthy, like, like Lamette actually can come back and start 30 games for them. That is terrifying. That dude's an absolute stud. Like, I mean, you know, all of a sudden they might have like, they might win a hundred games next year. And uh, I think they probably should go out and make a move or two, but I, I don't know. I wouldn't be freaking out too much if I was a Padres fan. Sam, your thoughts. You're muted. You I'm, I'm a hundred percent, hundred percent on board with that. Uh, I think like, I think it's a collection of good baseball players, which, uh, you know, tends to make for good baseball teams, but uh I think basically even at the beginning of this year, the thing that stood out the most to me was like, they have an embarrassment of riches for pitching, I think, because so Musgrove has been good. And then Lamette coming back, he was like one of the best pitchers in baseball last year. And I think it's easy to forget. They also have Mike Clevenger who will be coming. I think he'll be ready for the beginning of next year. Pretty Uh, much completely forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. They have Clevenger coming back too. Like, yeah. And then they have, and I like Darvish kind of hit a wall halfway through this year and Snell has been pretty iffy, but I, I doubt they're as bad as they have been. I, I, I would firmly believe that. And then they also have, they have Gore and Morion. And I, I think the starting pitching has like a ton of upside. And uh, like the thing with that sort of rotation too, is that when you're, when the bottom of your rotation is that strong, it's uh you know, tough to face up against. Uh, and in the lineup too, I mean, Tatis is obviously, Fantastic. Machado is still good. Grown North has been great. Uh, I, I, I'm, it's sort of hard to explain exactly what went wrong because everybody – like there's there's not a lot of holes. Uh, the bullpen is fine. It has been fine. But, uh, uh, yeah, I I thought I was going to be in the minority, but, I mean, we'll see what everybody else thinks. But I, I don't think there's like a ton that needs to be done. It's, it's a good team. It just kind of didn't work. Quinn. So I think that the clubhouse tension or whatever is being talked about, I think that that's a bit of an exaggeration of what's actually happening. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people upset <clears throat> upset because they're underperforming. They were expected to some people thought they might win the division or ease, like be contending for the division. And then it was, and now they're not even going to make the playoffs. And, but like, and I also, I think that a lot of this stems from last week when they were caught on camera, like when Tatis and Machado were caught on camera, sort of like arguing in the dugout because Tatis got called out on strikes and didn't like it. And that umpire was pretty terrible. So I don't completely blame him, but then Machado like kind of got in his face, like he was kind of just blowing everyone off. And then Machado, who really, I mean, another huge part of their team going forward. Um, then he kind of told him, like, hey, you can't get thrown out. Like, and like, you can't get thrown out. You can't, you, it's not about you. Like, you're the best player on the team. We need you here. You can't get thrown out arguing balls and strikes. Like, <clears throat> Machado was definitely right about that. And I think that's just something Tatis needed to hear. But I think a lot of people thought, oh, this is, oh, what's going on with the Padres? This is a big issue. Um, so yeah, I think that was kind of, I think all of it's kind of been a little bit overblown. Um, and then also, uh, I think that injuries definitely have hurt them. Like it looked like they were going to have an abundance of pitching at the beginning of the year. And now like, it's hard to really say what's going on with them. Um, like they just haven't been really effective and they, they yeah they like the ones who haven't been hurt haven't been great aside from uh, Musgrove and uh, but I I think that Preller still put together a team that is going to the core is going to be together for a while um, they are 
like a lot, like there are some rentals, of course, but a lot of them are going to be sticking around for a while. They've still got a pretty strong farm because you would always hear after every trade, like, oh, they didn't have to trade so and so. Um, so yeah, I think that they're still in a pretty good position going forward if they can get healthy and maybe maybe add some pitching just if nothing else just to put fans at ease a little bit and also just make sure that there's just make sure that you're going to have that pitching even if you do get hit with a bunch of injuries again next year but if there was one change i would make um i've this is really just a continuation of from what happened last year i i would think about getting rid of jace tingler because I still, it still didn't sit right with me that he made Tatis apologize for um, hitting the grand slam on a 3 0 count against the Rangers. Like, that, that never sat right with me. It never will. I think he, like, threw his best player under the bus in front of national media. And, like, if, if nothing else, he should have, like, I mean, if he genuinely had a problem with it, he could have, like, like, he didn't have to put it out all in the public like in the public light like that, like he did. Um, so I would say uh, that would probably be what I would do if I was going to do anything. But aside from that, I, I think they're in a pretty good position still going forward. Can I tell you about a certain major league manager that might happen uh, <laughs> on the south side of Chicago who you might be familiar oh, with? Oh, yeah, that guy. Um, a, a similar story to Tingler's there, but I digress. Uh, Christian, your thoughts? Yeah, so we were speaking about the pitching injuries and whatnot. Michael Baez, Denilson, Lamette. Adrian Morahone, Keon Kella, Dan Altavilla, Drew Pomeranz, Matt Strom, Chris Paddock, Blake Snell, Yu Darvish all spent significant time on the IL this year. That's like <clears throat> most of their pitching. Uh, most of the bullpen that was really, really strong going into the year, they were hurt. Drew Pomeranz was awesome. He fell off because of injuries. Morahone, Kella. Uh, Tatis also spent some time on the injury list. Uh, but really, for me, their lineup has just been disappointing. You have Fernando Tatis and Manny Machado. Uh, Tatis has been awesome, 160 WRC+. Plus. Machado is at a 120, which like you expect more from a guy you're paying $25 million to. Truly, you expect more. His defense hasn't been what it used to be, so like his bat needs to progress. Will Myers and Tommy Pham, they're both sitting at 100 WRC+. Plus. Their on-base percentage is fine, but... They've just <clears throat> they need more of an impact because they have Austin Nolan, Victor Caratini at the catching spots. Neither of them are playing good defense, and both of them are below average catchers. Jerks and Profar is nearly an everyday player, and he has not been good once in any season. J Roy is a lover of Jerks and Profar. <laughs> but, but that man is two ply. He is not good. He does not deserve to be starting on a postseason team. Like I no. Um this deadline they traded for adam frazier who um if you've watched baseball if you've watched the pirates adam frazier was nothing coming into this season and he had a, like a really fine first half with a really like high uh, batting average with balls in play and he came to the padres and instantly regressed like he should have he has an 86 wrc plus hasiyan kim uh is at a 70 wrc plus that's been a a tough signing for them Jorge Mateo as well. Uh, there's just been a lot of downside. If if any focus is going to go into this offseason, they have to add an impact bat um, because that lineup desperately needs one. The pitching staff, like, you're going to get Mike Clevenger back. You're going to get a lot of these guys back. There's no chance you Darvish has a 430 year or whatever it is now. Is This team is way more talented than that. And they've also been a victim of circumstance because – the cheating lab is generational in San Francisco <laughs> right now. <clears throat> if you told me that Buster Posey, Brandon Belt, Carl, uh, Carl Crawford, uh, Brandon Crawford, were all going to increase their WRC plus by 40, I would have told you to get out of my face. Like, there's just no way that was conceivable. And I don't believe it's going to be conceivable uh, next season. Um, I think I, I agree. They should fire Jay Stingler. His comments throwing Tatis under the bus has never sat right with me. I don't think he's that good of a manager anyway. Managers don't really matter, so what they do matter for is protecting your players, and he chose not to protect his players. And I I think it's probably time they just get away with A.J. Preller. 
he's done good rebuilding that system. Uh, done really good rebuilding that system. I just don't see him doing more. I uh, like there's nothing more that he can provide to that team right now. I'm of the opinion that someone's got to lose their job there. I think Preller's doing everything so far to scapegoat himself. He's he's fired the scouting director. He fired who got fired? The pitching coach, I believe. Yeah, yeah Ross pitching coach. So Ross mm-hmm. got fired. It's like everyone's getting scapegoated. It's like you built the team, dude. Like I I I I don't think there's. He's a fantastic scout. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. Like what he's done to that system is incredible, and his role in it is incredible. Great scouts don't mean you're a great GM. That's just my thing. Um, I, uh, I don't know if I'd say it's Preller's fault though. Like I, I don't I, know I, if it's Preller's it, fault. I'm just saying you got a lot of you got a lot of salary right now. You've got a lot of salary tied up, and you need to do something. You gave true. a bad, bad, bad contract to Hosmer, and that's, gonna hamstring, and that's gonna hamstring you for a little bit in mm-hmm. terms of what you can do to fix this lineup. It's like when you're yeah. spending out the you know what, you you can't afford to do that because now you're going to hit luxury tax. Now you don't even know what the CBA is going to look like next year. Mm-hmm. So it's like that that ends up being a huge deal in terms of, yeah, there's a lot of things that he couldn't control, but now he's got to fix things that he can control. And all of a sudden Hosmer's making what he's making. And uh, mm-hmm. he, he's a little stuck right now. I also don't that, think, Oh, so go ahead. Sorry. One thing that he could control that he allowed mm-hmm. to happen. And I just, I cannot fathom why he signed Jake Arietta to a major league contract and let him have eight starts yeah. of an eight year a or 10 30 year a, I believe it was. He allowed Jake Arietta to be on that team to get innings. He should be fired for that because Jake Arietta was embarrassing for a trash Phillies team last season. And then he goes to the Cubs did not do anything there had his true. worst season and it just continued to get worse and then he goes and signs him it was just no reason for that uh aj breller needs to go i liked his last start personally but <laughs> sure. i don't i i i think there's just many things it's just like i don't i never felt the the kim signing was really necessary it's like when you're starting to tie up things where now you're tying up money maybe unnecessarily to mm-hmm. positions that don't really need to be filled right now, it's like it becomes an allocation of resources question. I don't know. I think there's going to be changes for the Padres. I completely agree. There are things that could not be controlled. But after a season like this, it's like heads got to roll. And it's just that's the nature of the business. This is another question I'm really excited for because I've had a lot of conversations with people in, on Twitter with this one. Inning four, fact or fiction? Getting hot in September is a real and important thing for clubs heading into the postseason. We'll start with Christian. Um, I bounce back and forth on this, mainly because I haven't really had to watch the Angels go into the playoffs or get hot in September ever, so it's hard to <laughs> hard for me to say. But um, I I don't believe so. I, I truly don't. You could have a good September and you could make the postseason, or you could have a bad September and make the postseason. Once you're there, you're there. That first game momentum shifts the second game momentum shifts it's you're not going to stay hot in september and it's not going to translate because if you have a really hot september like the angels didn't say in 2014 we were awesome we won 98 games we got we got rolled on by the royals and all the momentum was gone after game one uh you see it all the time here uh it's just momentum is too much of a thing in the postseason and i don't see uh september really like affecting it too too much jay i know you're going to disagree with this one i just have a feeling okay so (laughs) okay so okay the the question in terms of do i think that being hot in september matters for the postseason is a little bit a little bit and I, i pretty much agree with what christian said i think that we're still a few weeks removed from like heart of postseason play you know like we're still a few weeks out of that like so much can change in that time you know the cardinals could go from the best team on planet earth that they are right now to a downright bad one like so much can happen in that time now i interpreted this question to be more about like you know how much momentum matters and i think it matters a great deal i think it's it's absolutely crucial i think momentum is so important i think once but then like and we're going to be able to see which teams have are riding that momentum once we get into 
once we get into those the past the first wild card game into the first couple rounds of the division series, you know, I think we're going to be able to see that. And then I think the teams that we see look the best in the division series are going to be the teams that, that have the best shot at winning the World Series. But, I mean, in terms of just strictly what is happening at this very moment, how much it matters for the postseason, it matters. Like, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm the Dodgers or the Giants, I'm scared of the Cardinals. I'm, I'm terrified of the Cardinals because – there will be zero pressure on the Cardinals in that wild card game if Max Scherzer, if Max Scherzer goes and lines up against uh, Adam Wainwright. There, there's not going to be any pressure on 45 year old Adam Wainwright who goes 85 miles an hour. Probably, I don't know. Like, I mean, like I, I, I mean, I would be terrified of them. So, I, in that sense, like, yes, it matters a little bit, but I think that. Like Christian says, there's another switch that flips. Like momentum changes in the postseason, literally every single game. So, uh, so I, I I mostly agree with Christian, actually. Sam, your thoughts? <clears throat> okay, so I'm I'm gonna try to articulate this the best that I can. So I think getting hot and having momentum, whether it's like a team or like a single player, I think it's very real. But I also think it doesn't matter. Uh, I think. I think if you've ever played, you know, any really any sport, uh, you can tell, you know, when there's a beginning going, like it feels like that goes on forever. And when you're when you win 16 games in a row, it feels like, you know, it feels like it'll never go down. And, and it is real. Like, I think that, uh, you know, success comes in clumps like that. But basically, hot or cold, I feel like you're you're, you know, on fire just until you're not. And I, I think, I don't know, I feel like there's not a lot of things that you can really compare to that sort of thing. But uh, it's just, I don't know, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it matters enough to put any stock into. Like, you know, say the Cardinals win out. Uh, if you're the Giants or the Dodgers, like, yeah, you're absolutely like worried about it. But those prior 16 games have no bearing on that one game uh, in all reality. It, it might feel like they do, but uh but they don't really. And I, I, that's, that's how I've always felt about like players being hot or teams being hot. Like, like, yeah, like it's definitely real that you can just have an unbelievable week or an unbelievable month or whatever, but it just doesn't say all that much about what's going forward. It just, it's what happened. And uh, I, I, yeah, that's, that's how I feel. It's real, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I want to agree with him. Real quick. Oh, I, uh, <clears throat> um, because yeah, I, I fully agree to that. Like, um, I view momentum in the same way I view clutch or clutch hitting in that sense. It's a real thing. You can see it with your eyes. You see it, but it's not quantifiable. And like, so it, it can't really matter to us. And momentum just ships inning by inning, honestly. We just use the words can't be quantified. Wow. And people say analytics people can't see both sides of the game. I digress. Quinn, your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I can disagree with this. <laughs> okay. But um <laughs> all right. Um I think the context matters. Like if your team has been hurt all year and then all of a sudden September rolls around like oh this guy this pitcher who's been on the IL all year he's feeling healthy. This guy who has yeah, just like like guys getting off the IL and suddenly you're looking and it's like September 15th and you're like, this is the first time that we're rolling out the lineup that we thought we were going to on opening day and all of a sudden they start winning. Then I'm not sure that's – I mean, I'm not sure that's momentum so much as it is a good team finally being the team they thought they were going to be, like the guys they thought they were going to have out there. Um, but then if you've got like – the same team like like if, if you've been like these are your guys this is you've had pretty much the same lineup since opening day then really that's just another few games especially if you know you're already going to the playoffs like if it's a team that's like been at a wide lead on the division all year like like if the rays or something had like a hot september then I think that would just be another another month for them because either way they're going to the playoffs and they're probably going to 
um, be a tough team to beat no matter what. But uh, just they like, yeah, I, and I agree that it's sort of like clutch. Like, I mean, it in like certain situate like it's just another situation. Like it's late in the season, um, and if you're good, then that if you're fighting for a playoff spot, it definitely matters. Um, and, and, um, so yeah, in that context, it matters, but also like, like say the Cardinals do win out and go into the wild card game on a 22 game win streak, then say Adam Wainwright throws a few bad pitches and then all of a sudden the Dodgers are up three zero and that's it. Like, um, yeah, so it of like I think it, it does matter like like you do you definitely do want to be good um even if it's just like a psychological thing like the players like they're feeling good they're they're thinking um yeah like nobody's going to beat us we're going to I'm going to go in and play my hardest like you definitely want that um rather than a team that just like maybe barely snuck into the playoffs and they're just feeling defeated. And especially if like injuries are like if a player gets hurt late on, then that's definitely going to be a concern. But um, yeah, like once you get to the playoffs, like everybody's in the same boat, like you've got to win like or after the wild card game, um, like then you've got eight teams all in the NLDS and aside from like home field advantage, they've all got to win the next, what is it? Uh, 11 games to win the world series. Like one of them has got to win 11 games. And I mean, yeah, like you've got to get that momentum or you've got to get that momentum eventually. Like uh, once the postseason starts, because you can win 110 games, like the 2001 Mariners, like won 116 games. And then once they got to the ALCS, they just kind of fell apart against the Yankees. So um, like, I think it's a good indication of, what teams are feeling are looking good and feeling good. But as far as like, if it's like, Oh yeah, definitely bet the house on this team. Then I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's as important as we may treat it. I don't know. I just have a, such a hard time putting stock into this because Yes, I get momentum is important. I think, Christian, you put it well, and Sammy kind of echoed his thoughts that, yes, momentum for – if a player needs to feel individual momentum t- to feel better about at-bats, like, great. I understand that. I played the game before. I understand that. But it, the math nerd in me in the back of my head always knew, okay, my average is 290. My chances of getting a hit here are still 29% no matter how good I'm feeling. Like, it, it still comes down to that at the end of the day. So that that's how I view it. Um, let's go into inning number five. Luis Severino returned to the mound this week for the Yankees after being out since 2019. How big is a, of a boost does he give to the Yankees' playoff chances, especially as they fight through this AL wild card? We will start with Sam. Uh, so he, like you said, he hasn't been around. He hasn't pitched since 2019, so uh, they're limiting him pretty heavily, I believe. His two appearances so far have just been two innings each. Uh, and he's looked fine. His, his fastball is down a couple of ticks. It's down to like uh, 95 and change uh, when it was up at 97. And when you're out for, you know, two years, it's hard to hard to be too concerned with that. Uh, but I think it's something that certainly doesn't hurt. It's There's a lot – there's worse things to have than to get another, you know, possible impact arm in the bullpen, uh, especially when uh, things have been a little shaky out there because – well, Isaaco was their best reliever, uh, and and Green has been good, and uh, I'm sure everybody knows what's what's been going on with Chapman, just sort of <laughs> some wild ups and downs. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think like an arm like that to put in the bullpen uh, for the rest of the year is certainly not not a bad thing. Quinn. So if Luis Severino comes back and he's the Luis Severino that we've seen before, then absolutely that's going to help them a lot but i think of course the question is is he going to come back and be effective because that is a big if with players coming off a big injury especially a pitcher um and yeah like if you 
and he's been pretty good his first two starts it looks like or his first two appearances um but it's hard to say how much stock to put into just four innings um but yeah i think if he comes back and he pitches like the ace that he can be um and has been in the past then he is of course going to be a great asset for them but even in the but yeah, that like whether he's at 100%, that's the biggest concern. And even if he's not at 100%, as long as he's not completely atrocious, um, and as long as he can like even come in during like low leverage spots to save other arms, I mean, that is always going to be beneficial. Um, may have been more so back when you had like the huge, massive rosters and could just call up some guy just to pinch run. But um, now that you've got to still be a little bit like aware, like got to conserve roster spaces a little bit um, since you only get two more. Um, yeah. But I, I just think that any, any pitcher who can be effective is going to be a valuable piece going down the stretch for them. Christian. Yeah, I, I think this is a huge addition for them right now. His uh, his fastball velocity is just a bit down. It's at 95.3. Uh, but they've already brought him in in high leverage against the Boston Red Sox, and he's been phenomenal already. They've lost Zach Britton. Uh, he's a huge piece of them. And they've had just other pen pieces not perform this year. Like Chad Green, is, he has been in so many poor situations. I feel bad for him. Uh, this is awesome for them um, because he <clears> – <throat> He has the ability to go deep into games. Uh, he can still give you leverage, and he, he's just one of the best arms they have, like second-best starter when he's healthy behind Garrett Cole. So it's a huge addition. I'm, I'm glad he's back in baseball. He's electric. Jay Roy, round us out here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm. So, this is so huge for them. I'm super high on Severino. I think he, you know, he was easily a top ten pitching talent when he played. I think he still might be. Uh, you're talking about a guy who like strikes out like close to 30 percent of hitters, doesn't walk a ton of them. I, you know, the last full season, the last two full seasons he played, he was pretty much a five and a half win pitcher both seasons. He's great. I having them here is going to be so big for them. I think you can put him. You know, if they go deep into the playoffs, I think they can use him really creatively, uh, really, uh, you know, just be really kind of like throw off the other team a little bit with how they use him. I, I wouldn't want to face this guy. I you know I think he uh, this is this is huge for them. I think anytime you can get an arm late in the year, you're probably better off more often than not. Uh, we'll, we'll see what this means for them, especially in that wild card game, since uh, they're likely to make it at, at this rate, and we'll we'll kind of see what happens as they go with that. I think that's a huge weapon to have out of the bullpen when you need to win a ball game. So. Inning six, Marcus Semyon, former White Sox, has had one of the quietest yet most solid seasons of anyone in baseball this year. He's up at 40 homers, and I believe he's either at or over it. Um, where does he end up in free agency next year? And what sort of deal could you see teams giving him? We'll start with uh, Christian. Um, where does he end up next season? That's a good question. I think Anaheim's going to be interested in him. Uh, ultimately, I think uh, Detroit's probably the best landing spot for him. Oh, I know Scott. I know yeah. Scott wants so much more than that, but I think uh, Detroit's a really nice. And um, I think it's going to be like a four-year deal around twenty-three million AAV. Uh, but that's that's about it. <clears throat> I think Detroit's the most likely spot. Assuming he would play shortstop. Uh, yes, he really wants to go back to shortstop. Uh, he, he's not a shortstop. He doesn't deserve to be back at shortstop. He should be <laughs> at second base for the rest of his career because he's just fine there. Uh, he's having a really nice defensive season at short. But yeah, he wants – or at second base rather. But he wants to go back to short, yeah. J-Roy, your thoughts? Uh, I kind of think the Braves might be a good fit. You know, I think that uh, Dansby has been – uh, pretty good defensively at short, but I, I don't know. I think that they could uh, – I think that I would rather have Simeon at that spot. You know, I think that – I I agree with Christian in the sense that he's probably – like he's been excellent defensively at second here – or at second, but I think he still plays a really good shortstop. I think that he's 
super solid defensively. And I mean, the last two seasons, the, the full seasons, the guys played, he's been literally a seven win player. Like he, like Simeon has been so good. I, I agree. Okay. I like the, the Tigers pick a lot too. I think that he could end up at Detroit and that would be a great, a great spot for him. And I think that that would really rejuvenate that franchise a lot. I agree with Christian. I think it'll probably be like a five-year deal around 20, 20 AAV. I think that's uh, that might be underselling him just slightly because the guy's production has been so so good. There's there's like there's so many teams that are in that are in the market for a shortstop or a slash second baseman. I would gladly take him on the Phillies. I, he would. You know, I Didi Gregorius. Shocker. <laughs> yeah, like like Didi really should not be on this team next year. And so, like, uh, if 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 he came to the Phillies, I'd be so happy. He's great defensively, and he's hit the ball really, really well this season and in 2019. So, uh, yeah. So the first two people say he's likely heading back to shortstop. Quinn, agree, disagree? Your thoughts in general on Semyon? Well, I think that. Um... He went from like a solid everyday player for quite some time to in the past two full seasons, at least like an MVP caliber player. Um, and he is what, 30 years old now. So he's probably like in the middle of his prime right now. So um, I would imagine that a team well, obviously like a team that's wanting to contend right now, um, is going to want him, but I would say, especially a team that might have a, might think they have a window, like the, their best shot is right now. Like, I don't think he's going to be getting like a long-term, like a super long-term deal. Like, um, yeah, I could see four or five years, maybe 20, 25 AAV. Um, I, yeah, cause he'll def he'll definitely, I uh, get a lot of demand, just like power hitting infielder. Um, yeah, who doesn't want one of those? Um, I could see, I could maybe see, I yeah, I, I could see Detroit for sure. Um, also, the Yankees could definitely be in the market for a shortstop if they don't get one of the, like if they do want, if he does want to go to shortstop and, they could see him at shortstop. Um, I could definitely see them in the market for him if they don't get one of the big ones like Correa or Story or, um, or well, he is one of the big ones, but like any of the others. I mean, um, and yeah, I I think that his he definitely could put up some good numbers for the next couple of years, but I'm not sure he's. Uh, I, yeah, I think whoever signs him is going to be someone who wants to contend, like, right now. Sam, your thoughts? Yeah, so, so I actually just finished writing about Semyon, and, and uh, he's, he's like, awesome. He's so good. Uh, I, like, I think there's a very far, fair argument that he's, like, you know, a, a pretty, like, top-tier player. Uh, but um, I would say – so he just turned 31, like, a week ago, I'm pretty sure. Uh and so he's a bit of a late bloomer as far as being this good is, but uh, uh, not, I, I'm going to have to agree with like everybody else. Uh, Detroit and the angels were the two that made the most sense. I feel like and maybe the white Sox, Jordan, I'm curious what you would think about that, but I feel like I could see that making a little bit of sense. I think you get two extra points. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it, it feels cause he, didn't he start there like briefly? He did. He yeah. was in a trade for Samarja way back. Yeah, and they are yeah, in the need yeah. for shortstops. Right. <laughs> Listen, oh, <laughs> Christian's gonna lose points. But uh, oh. but uh, yeah, no, I, I that made some sense in my head, and and being that age, uh, I again, you know, four to five years, mid twenties AAV, I think, I think that makes sense. But yeah, I um, I wanted to, I was looking at his stats right now, and uh, from twenty fifteen to twenty eighteen, it was four straight seasons of ninety seven WRC plus exactly. And then he pops off in 2019 with 138. He overperformed his uh, expected weighted on base average by 20 that season. And um, I was a big denier of Simeon. And I'm um, looking at it again. He he had 91 in 2020. And then he goes to Toronto. And his his expected weighted on base average is 330 compared to a 374 weighted on base average. 
and the when they were playing in that uh it was a dundee whatever the minor league stadium that's a good point it, actually his power numbers have soared i mean it's his only other season uh in 2019 he had a 237 iso isolated uh power and this season it's 277 every other year it's been 150s uh so i have a hard time like really believing in that power of his bat right now simply because he played in a launching ground and toronto now that they're back over there it's a launching ground too but he had what 27 28 home runs at that stadium i mean that entire team it's hard to really like trust how much of their offense is legit He's had a great second half, though. He does, yeah. He has eleven home runs in September, which is a lot. <laughs> right, right. He, he. But all right, I'm still like really iffy on his bat. I would not want him in Anaheim personally. <laughs> okay. okay. Interesting. No, that's fair. <laughs> I'm fine with it. I, in the launching pad that is guaranteed right field, but I don't think they're paying anyone twenty twenty five average annual value. Right. Not saying he doesn't deserve it, but I just don't think they're going to pay anyone that. That's just what I cry myself to sleep at night thinking about. Anywho, inning seven, the um, awards talk that J. Roy practically begged me for, even though it was already included when he saw the questions originally. The games are heading into their final weeks, meaning award season will start to come next as we have that as a topic of conversation as the games end. Which is the most exciting awards race currently? Or... Which is the one you really feel hasn't been decided yet? We'll start with the guy who is begging me for these, Jay Roy. So the most exciting race is definitely the NL MVP race. You know, oh, I think. I'm shocked. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'll briefly talk about the other. I think AL MVP race. I've been a huge proponent of Vlad the whole season. I think the race is so much closer than people want to admit that it is. Because it is, but that doesn't change the fact that Otani is the MVP. If I had a vote, I would work, I would vote for Otani 100. But Vlad has been generational this season. Uh, I don't really, I'm not too interested in either of the Cy Young races that much. I think that uh, I think it should probably be Scherzer in the NL, and I would love for Robbie Ray to win it in the AL. Uh, for uh, but the NL MVP race has actually been electric. Uh, I I think it's Bryce. I 100 think it's Bryce. He's been so 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 consistent all year he's been an absolute monster hitting for power hitting for average he's walking 17 percent of the time and he is he's spent most of the season right like most of the last couple months right below vlad in terms of way to run straight plus for the league lead he is now clear of both vlad and soto by a decent and not a large margin by any means but he's clear of them so he's been the best hitter in the league he's i mean he's hit for so much power i think that soto is having an absolute monster last month or so but i mean he's like soto's not the quality of contact that soto has produced this year has not been anywhere near what bryce has done and and so and soto hasn't been nearly as consistent the whole season he's this last month is carrying in him and yes on a rate basis that absolutely matters like this is still part of the season i, ju I just think the fact that bryce has been better the entire season bryce has played 10 less games but they're still tied in f4 you know i and the F4 difference doesn't really matter, you know, in a one season sample, but still I I think it should be I think it should be Bryce for sure. You know, I want to take points away from you for just begging me to put this on here so you could talk about Harper, but it's my fault for putting it on there. Uh Quinn, your thoughts. Yeah, so um I agree right now. NL MVP, it's Harper, but I do think that it is this last week. If Soto has a great week, I think he could definitely uh, leapfrog him. Um, but yeah, right now I would definitely vote Bryce. Um, yeah, I also think that NL Cy Young Award, um, I think that's pretty close. Uh, right now I think I'd give it to Burns, but I could certainly see – Max having an argument, especially like if he makes another really good start, um, which he does a lot because he's Max Scherzer. But <laughs> anyways, um, <clears throat> yeah. And then on the AL side, um, yeah, I'd say, I don't know. It could be, I think it might be close between Robbie Ray and Garrett Cole. Um, yeah. This, this last week might decide that, um, 
Then AL MVP. Uh, yeah, I'd say um, Otani and Vlad there at the top right now. But of course, uh, with a great last week, Moncada could go way ahead of both of them. Oh, that is clear pandering. And yeah, even no, it's I no, it's not. No, it's I not. can't even give you more than a point for clear pandering. No, that wasn't I, I don't think it was that obvious. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. Um I'd I'd give it to Otani. Um, even though uh yeah, um this dude just say what I thought he said. Like, I mean that was shameless and I loved it. That was shameless and I loved it. Yeah. I have um, some. I have some. I, I'd give it. Say, I'd yeah. give. I'd give it to Otani right now. But yeah, what Guerrero has been doing is just insane. But yeah, like Otani. I mean, doing it like both pitching and hitting at the level he has been. That is, that's something we may never see again. We've never seen it before. Um, yeah, it, I would. I would give it to him for sure. But Please. yeah, um, yeah. I. But yeah, the other ones like. Especially, yeah, especially NL MVP. That's one that I'm going to be keeping a close eye on because that's going to be an exciting one, I think. Quinn, if you wanted to pander correctly, you would have said Dylan C should finish top five in AL Cy Young. If you had done that, okay, but he actually might though. Like, I, I, and I'm not. Even I agree. I say he might. That that's that's a completely separate conversation. But I'm just I'm just telling you, that's how you pander. All right. But I, you know what? I really appreciated it, and I gave you three points for it. So I, I did appreciate it. Um, Christian, your thoughts on the, uh, races here. Well, uh, so the AL MVP has been decided since the season started, really. Uh, like in July was when I stopped really caring about people saying Vladdy was close to him because it's not, uh, as for Vladdy being historic, a 160 WRC plus is not historic. Um, it's awesome. I love Vladdy. He's the son of my favorite player of all time. Like it, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's one sixty nine right now, not one sixty. Oh, okay, that's not historic game. I have seen that every single. Okay, okay, but life. it's very impressive for a dude who people call fat and out of shape for for two years. Sure, well, he's no sure. longer fat and out of shape. Um, so. so that race has been decided in my eyes since July. The NL MVP. I was really pro Harper for a while, but Juan Soto has a 470 on base percentage. I don't care about any I, other stats. He, I, he's getting on base I don't so care. so much care. more often than Bryce Harper. Harper. I don't Bra care. Bryce's That's, ISO is 80 points higher. Congrats! It's his four. His on base is forty points lower. I don't care about the ISO. Um, but that's not really the races I care to talk about because the rookie of the year in the American League has been kind of fun. Um, not for Quinn, I would have to imagine, because the two top runners are Adelis Garcia and Randy Rosarena, and they have been pretty awesome. Uh, watching them go back and forth. Akil Badu, I always have to give a shout out to because he deserved to be in this rookie of the year race mm -hmm. and injury took him out. <clears throat> uh, and Wander Franco has been on base 41 straight games in a row. So he has really put himself Absurd. in the conversation for AL rookie of the year. And then NL rookie of the year would be Jonathan India. Uh, he said a comment about Dylan Cease, and um, you can take my points away. He has a 390 ERA. I don't care. He's not going to finish top 10 in Cy Young, nor should Quoting he. ERA. Minus That's five fine. Points. ERA for a single season matters. ERA over time does not matter. When talking about, like, awards. Don't you have that backwards? I know. Yeah, I, I did. But, like, for awards, ERA matters more than any other peripheral, which Cease is excelling He's, in. But... Uh, He's right, and I'm taking the points away anyway because I'm the host this week, not Diego. So he's right, though. It's like, why are you booing me? I'm right. Anyway, Sam, bring us home. All right, so I'm I'm actually gonna pander to to J Roy here a little bit. Uh, so I'm I'm as that's big, not gonna get you anywhere. Uh, that's, that's fine. I'm just saying <laughs> it'll get it, it'll get him somewhere guy. in my book though. I'll I'll, <laughs> well, that's all I need, right? But so. <laughs> I'm just, I'm a big Harper guy. I'm a, I'm a fan, and I wanted him to win another MVP just because I I've always like kind of felt bad of the way he was looked at. Like he's like he's very good. He's he's great, and he like always has been. So I, I wanted him to win another one. Uh, and then I also forgot that I made a preseason bet that Juan Soto would win. So you know, <laughs> I, I have I have my uh, my assets spread out. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah. But anyway, so the the thing I'm interested in is the NL Cy Young. Uh, 
because this seems to come up for at least one award every year. And it's like, it basically just how, how much time they've put in. So I was under the impression that Burns was sort of like the, the lock, but it doesn't really look that way anymore. And I'm curious if it's mostly because uh, of his innings pitched, just or sure it was innings pitched just because he has uh, like 40 more than Burns does. Uh, just not. But I, I'm curious, uh, basically just, where the philosophy lies like with the voters between those two. Uh, Cause I think for pitchers in a, like innings pitch matters if you're, you know, so I'm very curious how that one ends up. I would go for Burns, but uh, I'm, I'm very curious. Scherzer only has nine more innings pitched than uh, Corbin Burns, but Zach Wheeler Whoa. has 40 more innings pitched. Jeez. What am I looking at here? I don't know. Oh, I was, I, yeah, I was looking at Wheeler. My bad. Yes, you are correct. A few, okay, a few, I will say this. A few days ago, uh, me and Laz were talking in the Discord about how, uh, about uh, Salvador Perez, and Laz tried to tell him because I was, very, I was boosting Perez. Don't little, do something no. that's going to lose you your first. No, win no, I, no, this, this is, I'm, this, I'm, 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 you'll see why. I'm, okay. And then like, I said, okay, well, you know, like, this is awesome. Like, Perez is hitting for so much power. Then you said something about how well do you think you know more than the, <laughs> statist- the, the statisticians that make Woba and WRC plus because you know they weigh certain things differently. Christian by saying that he cares more about Juan Soto's 473 OBP is directly <laughs> contradicting the math and the the data that goes into the making of WRC plus because Harper is clear of Soto in that category. You're pulling receipts. Yeah, and if we're going to talk about OBP, how about Adolis Garcia's 287 OBP? That's... And Bryce's you know, is literally 435. Like, what are we talking about here? Like, all right, I'm done with you. You can have your win, though. That was, that was, I'll take my win. win. By the way, I'll this is my first ever win under. I know, guys. and I was waiting for you to do something where I'm like, I can't give it to him. <laughs> it was a flawless performance, J Roy. You, you held your own against. The bias that is having to go with me as counting your score. So congratulations. Yeah. Nice. Usually I let you go first, but Christian said his laptop might die. Oh, his laptop's already dead. I was going to let him go first, but looks like J. Roy, as we head towards what to watch for this week, you all know the drill. We're coming to the end, though, so it's going to be difficult to figure out what we're going to watch. Um, might be watching the same things, but J. Roy, you won. You're first. Yeah, so I'm just going to be watching this Phillies Brave series, you know, because it literally is going to determine if they make the playoffs or not. So I will be watching that very closely. Quinn? I'll probably be watching, uh, hopefully, win 17 in a row. And 18 (laughs) by the time this comes out, yep. (laughs) 19, I I hope. Um, And then, yeah, also, I'll be keeping a close eye on Harper and Soto. And probably also the NL Cy Young race because I'm pretty sure we're facing Burns. So that might make number 18 or whatever difficult. We'll have to see about that. But, yeah. And Sam, bring us home. I think I'm, I'm just going to be paying attention to really the only few races that are still – I'm yeah, I'm definitely watching Phillies Braves and then uh, – uh, those three ALEs teams in the wild card are definitely keeping up, and probably all of Harper and Soto's at bats. I'm very, very invested in that one, so looking forward to it. Both good and bad. There's going to be a lot of meaningless baseball played this next week, uh, which is going to make our lives difficult in recapping the week. But we've got some fun races, as they've all mentioned. We've got Phillies Braves, Phillies trying to hang in there. We've got fun races uh, for awards coming up. I don't know. I forgot to add my two cents, and I'll add it briefly before we leave. If Otani does anything like this for the rest of his career, he should probably win MVP every year. Someone who does it, on, Jay Wright, don't give me that look. Someone who does it on yeah, he's both been so sides anti ball, that the whole time. <laughs> someone who does it on both sides of the ball, like he does. What's more valuable than that? Okay, okay. I don't, I don't disagree with you, but I, I don't think we're, we're I don't think this happens every year. Like, like okay, I, I just, that's fair. If yeah. it doesn't happen every year, and he's just a 25 30 home run hitter and a yeah. 3 6 ERA type guy. No, that's not him. Yeah. But if he's putting up years like this, it shouldn't be close. No, I agree. Like I said, I'd vote for him. Fair enough. That's going to do it for us, folks. As I pull up our little uh, banner on the bottom for anyone listening, you know where to find us already, likely. Diamond Digest is the website. At Diamond underscore Digest is the Twitter. 
Instagram Diamond Dot Digest. As usual, like, follow, subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. Make sure to follow along with all of our writers. Their Twitter handles are listed here. Make sure to follow along with the page. We've always got good stuff coming out, especially as the playoffs come. So, for the now gone Christian Lloyd due to laptop difficulties, for the winner, J. Roy, Jonathan Roy, Sam Chapman, and Quinn Mortimer, this is Jordan Lazowski signing off. Take care, everyone. Enjoy your week. And we'll bring you some uh, playoff preview next week. Talk to you soon. Take care.